in any city, in any country, go to any mental institution or halfway house to which you can get yourself. No receptionist will speak with you. They are all well aware of your hidden motives. It doesn't matter, though, because you will not require their help in the hunt for this object. You are going to have to be totally prepared to proceed, though, if you wish to suffer no eternal damnation during your search. Your mind must be absolutely devoid of pride and lacking in ego, for if it is not, you will have no possibility of defeating this holder. Leave. If, however, you feel secure enough in your mental stability, ignore the incriminating stares of the people around you and explore the premises for the nearest building map. Memorize the room layout. You're looking for the one door not found in it. It will be unmarked. Upon finding said door, which should look wholly inconspicuous and could appear in any hallway in the institution, slowly achieve within yourself the focus required to defeat your unmet opponent and open the door. Walk quietly into the cell and sit on the bloody rug at the far side of the bile-clevered floor. Do not forget to first shut the door, or many people on the other side will be quite upset at you for allowing your new roommate to escape. The sleeping man chained medievally to the center of the room is to be called Jim, and he is the holder of infinite patience. Do not let Jim's emaciated form or peeling, charred flesh put off any of your guard, as the crimson rug on which you sit lies within the radius of Jim's iron chains, and he has not had anyone to play with for likely quite a long time. When your scent enters his nose hole, Jim is going to jump at you with excitement of new company, whom he has awaited for in his chain since the owner of the crusty blood you are sitting on attempted what you did today. The worst thing that you could ever possibly do in this situation is panic. Don't do it. Jim's playfulness can only go so far. Your fear will not please him. Any of Jim's victims would tell you that the last thing they did before meeting the gnarled ends of Jim's fingernails was panic, after which time they were thrown eternally into a room identical to the one you are in, cold iron chains wrapped around them as fire seeped into their cell through invisible creatures scorching their wretched bodies. No, instead, stare Jim straight in the eye without moving, without thinking, without breaking eye contact, with every sign of fear or self-doubt that you display comes a greater chance of your total damnation. The best strategy here is to just not be afraid of Jim, no matter how badly his hide stinks of madness and decay. I fervently hope that your dead stare will stop Jim from claiming his new plaything, and if it does work, and Jim becomes still, Seize this moment to address him by name. Jim, why has he put you here? Jim may become gripped by emotion if your timing is correct in your questioning and his mind is sufficiently still to coherently understand your words. Painfully, he will moan the story of his wrongful arrest and subsequent imprisonment, of his world taken away from him in a single, dehumanizing instant and he will likely weep, assuming he still has tear ducts by the time you reach him. Do not attempt to console the devastated man. There is nothing you could possibly do to remedy an eternity in isolated torture. Also, do not attempt to end his suffering through murder. If that were an option, and Jim were immortal, it would have ended a millennia ago. The only thing you can do at this point is to ask plainly of the poor man, to kindly give up to you that which he holds. He will offer you a handful of it. Take it and leave. Do not look back. The melted flesh is object 171 of 538. The suffering of an eternity resides inside. In any city in any country. Go to any school or educational facility you can get yourself to. 
When you reach the front desk, ask to visit someone who calls herself the Holder of Obedience. The secretary will blithely write your name onto a list without having to ask for it, and then direct you down the hallway. She will ignore you from then on, even if you address her directly. Follow the secretary's directions, and you will find yourself in front of a door to an office. When you open it, there will be another door behind it. You may well find yourself opening doors in futility for the rest of eternity. If you eventually make it into the room behind the doors, however, then you will find it rather plain and unadorned. Behind the desk will be a woman wearing outdated clothes and hairstyles, her face caked with so much makeup that you may well mistake it for a ghoulish death mask. She will motion for you to take a seat, but ignore her and instead ask, Whom should I obey? The lady at the desk will point down the hall from which you came. You will see that the many doors have disappeared, and the hallway has grown to an infinite length. Somewhere far down it, at the very edge of your vision, will be a desk. Run to the desk. Do not walk. Sprint with all your might you can muster. You will feel time slow to a crawl, and a thousand commanding voices will crowd your mind and drown out your thoughts. You must fight through the madness of this hallway and reach the desk before time runs out, or you will run ceaselessly until all time ends. The moment you make contact with the desk, the voices will stop abruptly, and time will revert to normal. On the desk will be a purple photo album with a strange design on the front cover. The moment you touch it, the woman from the office will appear beside you. She will tell you the full consequences of opening the photo album and learning the true answer to your question. The truth is far too great for any mind, mortal or otherwise, to handle. It is best to heed her warning and leave the album unopened. When you affirm that you will not open the album, the woman will give you a hammer. Use it to strike the album with all your strength. Both the hammer and the woman will shatter like glass, and you will soon find that the hallway is once again that of a normal school building. Take the photo album and leave quickly. The next day, the local news will report of a school faculty member murdered by a mentally disturbed student. The photo album is Object 172 of 538. To open it is to enslave the world. In any city, in any country, on a Thursday, head to any open park area you can get yourself to. It is suggested you bring along a firearm or other weapon you can use to easily end your own life, as this is preferable to any fate you may find during my task. Ask the first person you see where the Holder of Shadows is. No matter where you are, or where you live, or what temperature it is, it'll begin to snow. Do not allow yourself to be touched by this snow, or you'll be frozen for eternity, a silent sentinel of ice and flesh, never again to feel the warmth of the sun. When the snow ceases, you must run. Run as quickly as your legs will take you, for they will follow. Get to the nearest residential house you can find and knock on the door exactly three times. If nobody answers, or you knock too many times, close your eyes and pray that your death will be painless, though it very likely won't be. When you enter, there will be a single light in the center of the room, suspended in the air. Although it has no physical form, striking it will destroy it. You must do so or else the shadows cast by objects in this light will take corporeal form and attack. Act quickly. If you tarry, your chances of survival will be... small. When the light is destroyed, your entire house will be cast into pitch black darkness. Only the door you enter through will allow any light into the room. Do not attempt to exit this way or even look outside, for my beasts are still waiting, ever patient. Instead, you must find my basement and descend into it. If you are unfortunate enough to choose a house with no basement, you will have to look somewhat harder. 
Do not show any sign of fear or doubt, or you will find yourself lost in the darkness. The basement will be lit normally. If the objects in the basement cast shadows, then you will survive. If they don't, then commit suicide as quickly as possible. It'll be painless compared to what my minions will do to you. If shadows are cast, look for the nearest bladed or blunt object you can find and use as a weapon. As soon as you pick it up, the shadows will vanish from the other items in the room one by one. Close your eyes as tightly as possible, turn around, and swing your weapon. It'll feel as if your hand passes through water, and with the parting of the viscous material will come an unearthly scream, a scream beyond any reasoning or comprehension. Open your eyes. The shadow beast will drop to the ground, then dissolve. The weapon you hold will slowly grow hotter, then burning, then red hot, then white hot. If you do not let go, the fire will consume you and you will burn for an eternity and the eternity beyond that. When you drop it, it'll burn through the earth itself. Ignore the hole and grab the crystal at your feet. The crystal will be ebony black in color and fits snugly into your palm. As long as you hold it, the shadows will not envelop you, and you will see through any natural darkness. This crystal is Object 173 of 538, my gift to the seeker who has earned it. In any city... In any country with a working rail network, find the oldest train station of that city. When you're ready to seek the subject, and after you have said your goodbyes to those worthy of them, you must sell all your earthly possessions, with the sole exception of the clothes you'll wear that fateful day. Choose only the oldest and humblest of your rags for that purpose, don't lair. Do not attempt to make a profit, nor look around for the best deals. Just endeavor to get rid of your mundane encumbrance as quickly as you can for whatever sum you're offered. Collect all the proceeds in cash and pack them into a plastic bag, and then head for the station. On foot, don't you dare spend any of that money on public transport, water, nor food. Wait until the ticket selling booth is about to close and stepping in, state to the attendant that you need to go to the holder of detachment. The tired expression of the ticket seller will melt into abject horror and he or she will attempt to close the booth with trembling hands while refusing to look at you. It is then that you must present your bag full of money. At its sight, the fear will give way to sudden professional composure, and with a blank face and monotonous voice, the attendant will ask you, Is that all, sir? Before you can answer, though, the bag will be claimed, and from an ancient-looking machine made of blackened cast iron, a big yellow ticket will be produced and handed wordlessly to you. As you take it, the attendant will close the booth with rather unnecessary violence. On the ticket, you'll find printed the time of departure long after the last officially scheduled train and long before the first train of the next morning. Take a seat in the instructed platform and wait. You will not be disturbed by guards as the platform empties of the late riders going back home to lives of contentedness, the kind of which you have now renounced. Wait, and do not slumber. Wait, and mind not the unnatural chill lifting from the ground as the expected time arrives, biting to your bones and against which your thin rags offer no protection. Wait, and pay no attention to the clicking and rustling and hissing noises of the other commuters of this afterworld train line. Keep your eyes trained on the converging lines of the railway in the distance, whence the train will come forth to avoid undesirable interactions. Moreover, wait and hope against hope that you followed all these instructions correctly and that your payment was deemed true. Seven is a gross miscalculation of the numbers of hells, as you'll soon learn if an insufficient or untrue amount was paid and you were handed an incorrect ticket in exchange, instructing you to board the wrong train. If a train stops in front of you, make sure it's then exactly the hour printed in the ticket, and not even a minute early. 
Many things roam the railways at those hours, which are only trains on a vague external resemblance, and that feed on the hapless passengers willingly stepping into their sliding door-like maws. Finally, your train shall arrive precisely on time, a ruin of mold and rust seemingly incapable of standing still without falling apart, let alone being railworthy. Do not wallow in such considerations, though. Board quickly, for if it departs without you, morning will never come. Your soul shall remain chained to this now timeless platform, where you will wait forever for a train that never again will come. As you step inside, pray that you boarded a completely empty carriage, because otherwise I have no further advice or hope to give you. You knew the risks. If fortune smiled at you, pick and take a seat. I advise against taking one of the window seats, as you may be tempted to look outside the cold blackened windows and have your sanity scoured clean from your brain by the loathsomely otherworldly sights along the train's route. What follows is more waiting. What feels like a lifetime of waiting, joints aching, senses dulled by the monotonous, eternal, all-encompassing tack-tack of the wheels meeting the rail junctures. You'll wonder if you've ever done anything else than sitting there, or whether existence outside the train was ever more than a dream. Then, without warning, a creaking sound will announce the opening of the carriage door behind you, followed by slow but purposeful step towards you. As the steps stop next to your seat, hand out your ticket without looking up. The ticket will be picked from your hand, and you'll hear the rustle of something being scribbled on it. Never look up. Before you are given back your ticket, a mocking voice will ask of you, Are you having a pleasant trip? You must answer with as much conviction as you can muster. Is all of this actually worth it? A long pause will follow while you feel a burning gaze penetrate your being, so fierce that not even the marrow of your bones could escape its scrutiny. There's no way to know what or how the holder judges, but from the answer, you'll learn your fate. If yes is the answer, you'll arrive soon at the place from whence you departed, where coming the morning you'll be able to claim a refund of your money just by showing your face. Squander it at your heart's content in all worldly pleasures, for only a couple of days of your life remain before being claimed by a most gruesome death. On the other hand, if the answer is, of course not, you'll arrive at some other station in a country far away from your own. Wretched and lost, you will wander for a long years, never accumulating anything other than misery. Death itself will seem reluctant to give you deliverance, intent as you may seek it, until the day your weary, impossibly old body finally falls apart. The answer you're hoping for is, that, friend, is up to you to find out. Only then the ticket will be given back to you, and shortly after, you'll arrive to any train station in the world you wish to go. The signed ticket is Object 174 of 538. Anything that is up for sale in this world will be given to you upon producing it without a single word passing. Regardless, never again will you be able to derive joy from anything you possess. In any city, in any country, wait for a night that is cold enough for you to see your breath in the air. Climb the tallest building you can find and make your way to the edge of the roof. Whisper into the darkness that you wish to visit the one who calls himself the Holder of Ashes. Ever so slowly the stars in the sky will wink out one by one until only the moon remains. Wait until the moon fades into darkness and no other sound can be heard except the soft blowing of the wind. You must then step forward off the ledge. If you turn back now, you'll be forced to wander in the cold, silent darkness forever. You will fall slowly and land on the hard earth. You must rise from the ground quickly 
and make your way forward through the darkness. Black feathers will fall all around you. You must not make any sound, or the infinite legion of ravens fluttering about silently above you will descend and feast upon your flesh for all eternity. After an indeterminate amount of time, ranging from hours to weeks, you will see before you a man standing in the darkness. He is old and wrinkled, wearing nothing but a brown loincloth. As you near him, you will see he has black feathers stapled roughly into his skin over the entirety of his body. He will stand silently with his head bowed. As you approach, the feathered man will slowly raise his head. You must bow your own head at this, for to look into his black jewel eyes is to look into the depths of nothingness. The man will slowly raise his arms to his sides. The black feathers will blow to and fro in the sudden, heavy wind. He will throw his head back and let out an unearthly screech. You must cover your ears and shout over the blowing wind and the unearthly wail, Why were they silenced? The man will stop and cock his head to the side. Suddenly, he will begin to cry tears of burning pitch. His body will ignite in crimson fire, and you must quickly look away, else the flames leap hungrily and consume you as well. Wait until the man is nothing more than ashes, then sweep through his remains. There you will find a small black statue of a raven, with its wings spread wide, made from compressed ash. When you pick it up, you will find yourself at the foot of the building from which you jumped. The statue is Object 175 of 538. When the time comes, it will rise from its own ashes and sing the song that ends the earth. In any city, in any country, go to any place of worship you can get yourself to. Go inside and ask any of the people you see there, I wish to see the holder of opening doors. If they ignore you, you have come to the right place. Sit in the exact center of the structure and wait. Wait until all is empty and dark. When it's time, you will hear singing. It'll be the most beautiful song you have ever heard, but don't listen to it and keep looking forward. If you concentrate on the song, you will sit there until the end of time, waiting for the song to stop. If you keep your mind open and without thoughts, a child will stand behind you. You will hear its voice, but don't turn around or the child will be gone. Instead, you will see another world where you will know the true meaning of pain. Stand up and walk slowly towards the door without any decoration. Stand in front of the door and the singing will stop. When the singing stops, don't move. Don't you ever move. The door will open on its own and when it does, a mirror will appear. In it, you will see yourself, but not as you are now. When you see your reflection move, mimic it. But remember, it's a mirror, so right is left and left is right. If you do not move correctly, the mirror will shatter, and you will suffer the fate of every evil a human can and cannot imagine. Should you succeed in following its movement, ask the child behind you without turning around, Why is the door open for me? He will reply with a cute yet almost sick laugh, and you will see the reflection of yourself fade and turn into a younger version of yourself without eyes or limbs. Touch your body and it'll change to emulate your reflection. If you keep calm and walk into the mirror, you will enter a hall of doors. Endless doors. Don't fear, however, because the doors will open. Walk and don't enter any of them. Instead, walk towards the one closed door and touch it. Yell at the top of your voice, I wish to enter the door of my closed mind, and it will open. You will see your past. Watch your past play out, focus, and wait for an important event such as your first kiss. 
when the event happens, you must say, this is me. You will find yourself standing in that period of time, watching as your life plays out at its regular speed. You must watch, immobile. When you are finally able to move, you will feel strange. Go to the place of worship again and you will see yourself sitting there. Tell your reflection of the event. It will cry and vanish. All that will be left is a blackened, dead heart. That heart is object 176 of 538. If it sheds blood, you will be able to relive the past. In any city, in any country, go to there, do that, and get this. Admit it. That's what's interested you in this lifestyle. Promises of untold power in exchange for completing a few measly tests. That's the reason why there are so many bright-eyed new seekers coming out of the woodwork, hoping to get themselves a shiny new object. And that's the very same reason that those seekers rarely seem to keep their optimism and innocence after they obtain said object. The problem merely lies in how the objects dishearten people and remove all joy and happiness. Well, except mine, of course. Even the objects have their ports in the storm, so to speak. However, if you really are a seeker, you know the drill. Everything has its price, and I'm not going to give up such a rare treasure so easily. On a night when the moon is particularly full and bright, go to the river closest to the place that you hold most dear. Bring your most prized possession, and a watch if you can't see a clock from said river. When the time is exactly 11 o'clock, burn your possession. If I want to see you, you'll find a small blue marble in the ashes. If you see this, scatter the ashes into the river. Now, be patient. I'm not the fastest holder, and I need time to get from place to place. Don't be disheartened, however, because I'll always appear by sunrise. Don't be naive about my blindfold when you see me. I can certainly see you. In fact, I'll be elated. I'll welcome you with outstretched arms and ask you something along the lines of, Don't you love how it catches the light? This is when you must make your choice. If you decide to leave the marble on the ground and walk away, then I'll remove your desire to find any more objects. If this will be your first, I may have just saved you from eternities of perils of other holders. However, if you have any other objects, their hunger will come back through you stronger than before, and you may never lose yourself from their voices. And please, don't try to defy me by throwing the marble into the river. That marble is my responsibility, and it's very frustrating to find... Despite my calm demeanor, I am still a holder, and I could always use a plaything to help me deal with my frustration. If, despite my proposal, you decide to follow the path of seekers before you, then you may ask me, what were they like before, and give me the marble. Take a seat, because my story can take a while. I'll tell you about the times before the objects were made, and how they were used to be pure, but they changed forever. Your mind probably won't be able to even comprehend most of the details of my story, but if you can withstand it, I'll let you have the object. As you probably guessed, it's the blue marble. I will tear out your eye and replace it with the marble. After the pain subsides, you'll never know the difference between the marble and your old eye. Now. Here's where the perks of my prize come in. No doubt that's the reason you've come after this. If you show anyone your new eye, they'll see your version of paradise. You'll even be able to placate yourself for a while if you look in the mirror and stare at it. But the marble isn't perfect. As your hunger for objects grows, people who look into your eye will find a vision of the reunion. You'll lose a few friends like that if you don't find yourself a blindfold. Furthermore, 
you'll find nothing but frustration with your illusions, swearing at yourself for not being able to bring them together, but don't dwell too much on these facts. It could be years before the marble would allow these things to happen to the seeker that possesses it. I suggest you enjoy the time between ownership and madness while you can, before it fades. The blue marble is object 177 out of 538. While it may be the brightest star in the sky, its light will not last very long. In any city, in any country, go to any mental institution or halfway house you can get yourself to. When you reach the front desk, ask to visit someone who calls himself the Holder of Change. The attendant will look at you with a sinister grin on his face and then tell you, yes, but first you must do me a favor. Once this is said, do not speak a word, for if you do, you will be instantly transported to a place with creatures unlike any this world has ever seen. Shapes constantly shifting into ever more nightmarish forms. You could pray for a swift death, but there won't be anyone listening. If you correctly remain silent, however, the attendant will ask you one more time, this time with a hint of urgency in their voice. Ignore their plea, and then ask again for the holder of change. The attendant will look at you with disappointment on his face, but soon enough he or she will lead you to an unused supply closet. Before the attendant leaves, lock eyes with them. If you break eye contact for so much as a blink, you will surely be devoured by the creature that led you here. It knows this, and will leave very, very slowly. Once the attendant is gone, step into the closet and close the door. Shut your eyes for exactly five seconds and reopen the door. You will see a small, windowless room with a young female child standing in the center of it. If there is no child, close your eyes while whispering, Fear does not shake me. Once you are finished saying this, reopen your eyes. If still no girl stands in the center of the room, there is no hope for your life. The girl you are looking for is the one standing behind you. Once you assure the girl is there, shut your door once again, and this time wait for three seconds exactly. Reopen your eyes and turn the handle once again. This time the room will look decayed and heavily aged. In the center of the room will lie the corpse of an elderly lady. In her hand, a revolver with five shells. Quietly whisper these exact words. What were they once? If said incorrectly, the door will slam behind you and the gun will vanish from her hand. You have done wrong and will spend the rest of eternity locked in a room with a rotting corpse. If said properly, the corpse will speak from beyond death, telling you in the most disgusting and horrible way a tale from before time all the way to the current second. After she is done, you must grab the pistol from her hand and shoot yourself between the eyes. If all goes correctly, you'll wake up in the lawn of the mental institution, holding in your hands the very shell from the bullet you shot yourself with. If not, well... The empty casing is Object 178 of 538. You know what they were once. Dare you attempt to recreate it? In any country, go to any area where archery is practiced. Rent a bow and ask for the one on the bottom row, third last one on the right. With it, you will receive 14 arrows. All of them, except one, should be fletched with yellow and white feathers. The odd one out will be fletched with black. Proceed to fire your arrows, but do not ever use the black one. You may continue shooting well past closing time, you will not be interrupted by anyone. As night falls, knock an arrow on your string and fire it just as the last sliver of sun sinks below the horizon. 
No matter your skill, no matter your eyesight, the arrow will be a perfect bullseye. At that instant, a wave of black and violet fog will erupt from the target and will form a ring with a diameter that encompasses seven targets, including yours. When it fades, you will see that where it once sat, in the middle of a wide plain or at the edge of a forest, the range is now located at the top of a dirt-capped plateau. It's advised that you move from the middle of the range, as an arrow will be headed directly towards you. The owner of the arrow is a young woman, someone who looks to be a year younger than yourself. Her flaming red hair whips straight back, as if a wind blows straight into her face. In her hands, she holds a bow carved from blue wood. Over her right eye, she wears a white eye patch marked with a symbol similar to the one on your eye. She'll beckon you over and challenge you to a contest of marksmanship. How you do on your first two shots is not important. When you knock the third arrow, a large beast-like demon will vault over the edge of the plateau. Releasing the shot will fire it straight through its head. It'll be a drop in the ocean though, as the one beast will be followed by thousands of others just like it. Before the first wave hits the ground, grab the archer around the waist and kiss her as if it's the last thing you could do before you die. It's highly likely that it will be. Time will stop. The beast demons will hang in midair. As soon as you break contact with her, ask her, who is among my allies? Her answer will come in the form of a story that details every shadow-cloaked assassin in human history. At the end, she will take off her eye patch and hand it to you. You'll see that, lodged in her right eye, is a twisted iron arrowhead, blood pouring from the wound as if it was fresh. You should knock your black arrow, as she is knocking an identical white one, stand back to back, aiming towards the frozen mass of demons, and at the same time, fire. The resulting whitewash explosion will knock you out, and you'll wake up in the bed of the place you call home. Over your right eye will be the eye patch. The eye patch is Object 179 of 538. Wearing it will reveal to you who your allies truly are. In any city, in any country, go to any bordello that you can get yourself to. If you can find the owner, notify him that you wish to see someone called the Holder of Seduction. Should the mere vocalization of the name bring the feeling of pleasure and fear to them, then you have come to the right place. They will lead you to a door previously unnoticed in the bordello, and you will descend down a flight of stairs alone. The descent will take up to ten minutes, and you will notice that the area around you will seem to grow older. not decay, but rather seem more dated in design. The steel railing will morph into wood, the drywall will become stone, and the stairs beneath you will seem to be carved from rock. You will exit into a circular ring that seems to encompass a large cylindrical room. Should you turn around, the door you entered from will not be there. Several doors will line the inner side of the ring. You must enter the seventh from your starting position clockwise. The interior of the room resembles a satanic summoning chamber and, as with most summoning chambers, a demonic presence will be felt. Ancient bones litter the ground. The walls are tinted red from millennia of bloodshed. A pentagram will be laid out in the center of the room, glowing with a fierce orange hue. In a carved alcove, you will find a book and a dagger. No matter what page you turn the book to, you will find a single incantation. Taking the dagger in your hand, you must let the blood from your body in any way you choose, while reciting the incantation over the pentagram. Should the ritual fail, I cannot help you any longer. Suffice it to say, the bones are most definitely the remnants of seekers who failed the ritual. Should it succeed, however, a column of flame will erupt from the pentagram. When it fades, a being will appear. Depending upon who you are exactly, this creature's appearance will change. It may take the shape of your worst enemy, or your best love, or mentor. Regardless, it'll be male if you're attracted to males, and female if you're attracted to females. 
No matter whose shape it takes, it will be very, very beautiful. Its nude body and succulent figure will taunt you with every glance. You must ignore these temptations, for submitting to the seduction of the holder is a fate worse than death and greater than bliss itself. Pain, agony, joy, and pleasure will all meld into one feeling that will leave you paralyzed and unable to react as the being mates fiercely and passionately with you, and it will not stop until every ounce of your life force has been drained. You may ask it only one question. How does it tempt us? The creature may answer, it may not. If it chooses not to recite the answer to you, you're not out of luck. The book will stay open with you upon your return to Earth, and it will contain the answer. The dagger, however, will remain here, or to be precise, in the heart of the creature. As long as it is bound by its chains, it will not be able to harm you. Stab its heart and release it from this plane of existence. It'll burn and scream a scream more terrible than any other cry in the history of the universe. Even if you are an experienced seeker, the sound may still send chills through you. Once it has completed its death, the door behind you will swing open. Exit, but make sure to take the book with you. That book is Object 180 of 538. With the instructions inside, you may summon this demon at will to fight beside you, but take care not to fall into its sexual temptations.